18th annual HGTC Addiction and Recovery Lecture Series. My name is Wes Fondren. I work across the street at a school over there. But tonight I'm here because I'm a person in recovery and I, I always benefit from the series. And uh, I wanted to talk about it just for a second. This is the 16th year, which is astounding. That's amazing. Yeah, that's amazing. I'm curious what the percentage was. How many people this year is your first year to attend one of these? Holy smoke. Okay, great. Well, that's way over half. And so if you think about it for a second, if you think about four of these a month, for 16, uh, four of these happen every year for 16 years, and that many new people are coming, it's thousands of people that have probably been impacted who have come to these meetings to hear about addiction recovery in the Grand Strand. And two years ago, we had to do them online, and so the numbers really kind of exploded there. And in fact, that's the first place that I got to hear Dr. McCauley was, was uh, when he did the live stream. And so it's an amazing thing. This has been happening for 16 years, and the person who founded it and that's responsible for it and does all the directing is Casey King. And Casey's going to speak here just in a moment. And uh, Casey's one of my best friends in the whole world. He's going to be my sponsor as well. And uh, he starts working on this in July, uh, sometimes a little bit before that, where he'll start talking to me and start contacting speakers and making arrangements and working with the, the different sponsors that help put this on. By the way, a huge thanks to Ori Georgetown uh, Technical College. Yeah, for hosting um, this. Um, next week, some of the other sponsors are going to be presenting. So on um, this exact same time next week, we'll have, uh, I think it's four, is that right, Casey? Four, yeah, we'll have four of the different local sponsors that will be presenting, that, that they're all involved in recovery, different aspects of recovery. And so please come back and, and uh, honor the, the sponsors by hearing the, the great material they have to share. And then two weeks from now, it will be students in recovery. And so um, it would be fantastic if you came and supported those students who are in early recovery that are coming to share their story. And so it would be wonderful if you, if you came back to hear them and support them and, and their, uh, their early recovery. And uh, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn it over to Casey. As I said, he starts working on these in July. He, by the way, every single one that's ever happened, Casey is the one that handled all of the details. And so for 16 years, 16 Februarys, which is almost a year and a half of Februarys, which is astounding, Casey has tracked down all the speakers, made all the arrangements, handled all the interviews, the, the PR, the everything that goes on with it. And so uh, Casey is the person to thank if you've ever uh, enjoyed one of the talks, got something out of it, or just enjoyed the meal. Casey's the one that handles all that stuff too. And so thanks to Casey, I'm hanging off you. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Casey. <clears throat> I'm a physics professor here at the college for 28 years. I'm the coordinator, the originator for the series. I'm also a person in long-term recovery. For me, that means I have not felt it necessary to alter my consciousness since September 15, 2005. When I had the idea for this series in 2008, there was no blueprint for how to do this. So I, I kind of put it together, and in the beginning, it wasn't nearly as coordinated as it is now. Um, but the point is, there's a celebrity speaker, which is what we had last week. The celebrity speaker in recovery is to get your attention. You might want to come to hear the celebrity, but then you hear the message. And then another, another night, which is tonight, there's the medical or psychological perspective speaker. Uh, over the years, we've had William Moyers from Hazleton up in Minnesota who came and spoke. Dr. Karen Brady, you know, Vice President of Research at MUSC. Judith G. has spoken here before. So we've used local speakers, we've used national speakers. Um, tonight's speaker has been asked to, to examine biological and psychological issues that drive addiction. Our speaker is nationally and internationally known. He spoke recently in Australia. We were talking about it at lunch today. Uh, from Sedona, Arizona, and a senior fellow at Meadows Behavioral Healthcare. Please welcome Dr. Kevin McCauley. Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you so much for coming. It's wonderful to be back in, uh, that's a little hot. Yeah, great. Okay, perfect. That's excellent. Thanks. It's wonderful to be back here. Um, still a little hot. Yeah, perfect. All right. 
I think I can carry this room, so just a little bit of extra uh, amplification is all I need. Can you all hear me in the back row? You're, uh, you're good? Okay, if I, my voice drops, let me know. I'm getting over a cold. Um, but it, it's great to be back here. I was here in 2016 and I had a great time. Um, over the last, wow, 20 years, I've kind of you know, gone from small community to small community or small city to small city. And, and kind of learn what that community is, is going through in terms of addiction. And this started before the opioid epidemic. And I really enjoy you know, listening to, to the solutions that that community came up with uh, for you know, helping uh, people in recovery. I was up in Marquette, uh, at the very top of the upper peninsula of Michigan. Uh, and there, um, they have a, a warming center because it's so cold there, and that's where a lot of people get into recovery, actually. Uh, so that was, that was kind of neat. Um, what I want to talk about tonight is sort of the long version of the lecture that I do at our treatment program. My, my job is to basically go to each of our programs, and we've got, we've actually got 19 of them, but I go to nine of them every month. And I do the lecture on the, the neuroscience of addiction. And, uh, and, I, and I do that because I think it's a, an important part of a person's treatment to at least be introduced to this neuroscience because it can be very validating when people understand that there are reasons for what they're doing, brain chemistry reasons. I think that that, that can be therapeutic. Um, I really encourage uh, our patients to ask me questions to kind of interrogate this information. And so I've certainly uh, would like you to feel free to do that too as we go along. Please feel free uh, to raise your hands. If you would like this slide deck, it's yours. This is my this is my email, and I'm, I'm an easy person to reach. If you would like any of the journal articles that you'll see quoted here, I can send those to you as well. Um, and I'd be glad to answer any questions that you might have uh, into the future. If you hear something here that you want to, to, to know more about, please feel free to uh, contact me. I, I do have these two films that I made uh, back in 2016 and 2011, uh, and they uh, one of them kind of explains the neuroscience of addiction. It's actually, even though it's kind of old, it's holding up pretty well, actually. Uh, the, there's nothing that's wrong in it. Uh, and then the, the newer film, even though it's about six years old, uh, is really more about uh, the solution, you know, how people, uh, or what are the things that we know really predict success <laughs> Uh, in recovery. So I'm just going to kind of dive in. We've got 250 slides. I don't think we'll do all 250 of them, but uh, let's, let's see how good a job I do. And I, I kind of like to start by telling you about four patients that I've met over the years that, uh, that I think uh, really point out some important features of addiction. And the first patient was really the first patient that I ever saw. <laughs> Uh, as a medical student. So this is in the first few minutes of my first rotation in the third year of medical school. So in the third year, the classroom is behind you, now you're in the hospital, now you're with patients, and my, my rotation was sur general surgery. And so this was the really the first patient on the rounds that morning. And he was an elderly gentleman who was well known to the surgeons uh, because he was back for uh, a bout of pancreatitis uh, brought on by his drinking. And I remembered when they mentioned that as we walked into the room, I remembered something that one of the professors in pathology said, that pancreatitis is on that short list of things that are so painful uh, that, that uh, they're one of the most painful things you can have and still live. So this gentleman had been you know, under uh, quite a bit of pain. And I'll never forget, you know, we walked in there, he was asleep, we turned on the light, his eyes opened, they were fluorescent yellow. Uh, his hands flapped as he tried to bring the sheet to his chin as all these surgeons you know, gather around his bedside. And I'll never forget the sight of the chief surgery of my medical school basically saying, listen, that pain in your belly is you dying. And if you don't stop drinking, you will die. And we're getting tired of fixing you up, don't need to have you back here. So, so tell us now, are you going to quit or are you going to die? And I'll never forget the, those fierce yellow eyes gazing back at that surgeon. And, and the gentleman said, you know, I, I, what if I could? <laughs> and that was a very, very poignant moment. Uh, you've got a surgeon who can really do anything in the OR, just amazing things. But he's powerless to, to reach his alcoholic patient. And you have a patient who's endured unbelievable pain. 
And yet, when he senses that judgment, when he senses that rejection, he, he just pulls away from the whole thing. And I've always wanted to know, what was he protecting? What, what was he willing to go through to save? And I think that, that that's an example of addiction, is that we really will almost trade our body, cell for cell, to protect this connection that we have to our particular intoxicant. Uh -oh. So I'm gonna use uh, stock photos here to sort of uh, paint the picture here. It didn't look exactly like that. It was a little bit more uh, hostile of an interaction, uh, but basically it was the, the doctor and the patient. The second patient was actually the first patient, well, one of the first patients that I saw when I was in my internship. So now I've graduated from medical school, I'm a real doctor, I have a long coat. First night of my internship in the uh, emergency department of the Oakland Naval Hospital. And about halfway through the shift, the shore patrol brought in this sailor who had been um, uh, AWOL, basically. He missed a ship's movement uh, because he had an unauthorized absence. Uh, and they were bringing him in for me to do a confinement physical. He was a heroin addict, that's why he went missing. He had been using heroin for quite a while, and then he put some time together, and he was really happy about that, and he was really trying hard you know, to stay sober on his own, uh, but his craving was just terrible. And every day, he just craved and craved and craved, and he made it for a few months, but then eventually he said, I just couldn't take it anymore. I had to go out uh, and get some heroin. And that you know, took about two weeks until they tracked him down, and they brought him in to me, and uh, they, they don't do this anymore, but there's this line on the Navy's confinement physical that the doctor signs and says, uh, I'm of the opinion that this sailor can be put on a diet of bread and water. Um, because that was uh, an arcane punishment that the Navy used to have. They don't do that anymore. Um, but when you're stationed on a ship, if the, if the skipper wants to get your attention, uh, they'll stick you in the, the brig, which is usually just a room on a ship. And, uh, and you can have all the bread you want <laughs> and all the water you want, but that, that's it. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I signed that thing and off he went. Uh, that's addiction too. Uh, here was a person who um, was desperate to stay sober, <laughs> but he just couldn't take it anymore. The craving was, was too much. And what I found so moving about this young man is that he was absolutely ready to accept his punishment. In his mind, he had failed, and he deserved everything that was about to happen to him. And that's addiction, too. We really kind of take on that burden and believe that, you know, if we don't stay sober, it's our fault. He could not have known that there was a system that was kind of working around him uh, that made it almost impossible uh, for him to stay sober. The third patient uh, is um, actually an entire nation, uh, I would say uh, the nation of the United States. Uh, when I graduated from um, my internship, I went to Pensacola, uh, Florida, and, and became a flight surgeon. That's about a six-month course that involves flying, and uh, I was stationed with an F-18 squadron in California, and uh, we were a training squadron, so we had three times the number of planes that a usual uh, Hornet squadron would have. Uh, we were the main fleet replacement squadron for the Marine Corps for the F-18 Hornet. So mostly we're just, you know, teaching students. And you could go on a different flight every day. And there were all kinds of flights. You could drop bombs out in Yuma, Arizona. You could uh, go out to the boat. You know, every now and then they would go out to the boat and uh, get their carrier qualifications. And, and this particular night, and this is a, uh, a Bravo model, um, but we also had uh, 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 Charlie, excuse me, uh, we had uh, Bravo and, and Delta models, which had two seats. This is a C model. Um, so you have to imagine, you know, a second seat here. And we were very, very high. For some reason, we were up about 45,000 feet. And don't ask me why. I only, you know, sometimes knew what the hell was going on from back there. Um, and when you're over California at night at 45,000 feet, you can see the entire state. You can see from Sacramento all the way down to San Diego, the true twin ribbons of the I-5 and the 99 kind of go down the Central Valley and they meet in what I would call the pelvis of California, where the, where the central, the south part of the Central Valley just before the grapevine. Uh, and, and I looked down and I noticed that there were these particularly bright spots down there that, that were really standing out. They were, they were brighter than the oil flares over in Kern County. They were brighter than the truck yards in Bakersfield. And I asked the pilot, I said, see those bright spots down there? What are those? 
And he said, oh, those are prisons. This is something that once you learn to see it, you cannot unsee. Uh, that is what is most visible, what will strike you the most over my home state, the state I grew up in uh, at night, is its system of prisons that are very, very uh, visible, you know, basically from space. Uh, and now every time I cross the United States at night, if I look down, you know, once you've learned how to see that outline, it's either a chemical weapons facility or a nuclear weapons station uh, or, or a correctional facility. And that's addiction too, that when you go up at about 50,000 feet, you can see addiction not in an individual or not in a community. You can actually see it in the entire nation. And so addiction operates at the population level too. It causes damage <coughs> at that level. Uh, it has a corrupting influence way beyond the people who actually use the drugs. And that's, I think, a, a, a tangible, visible sign uh, of how addiction plays out in an entire state or an entire country. The last patient uh, is me, um, and this came uh, after a couple years of being at the, at the squadron. I, uh, I had to have a, uh, a surgery, and I got addicted to the opioids afterwards. And I was basically uh, passing forged prescriptions. At that time, California used a triplicate prescription system, which is basically they, they send you pre-printed triplicate prescriptions with your name, your DEA number, they're all numbered sequentially. And if you want to prescribe a Schedule II controlled substance, you have to fill this thing out. And bad handwriting is actually a felony, so you want to make sure that the handwriting is legible. And then you take it, to the patient takes it to the pharmacist, the pharmacist tears it and has to keep one copy for five years. Uh, the, 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 the other two copies go back to Sacramento and the Bureau of Narcotics Enforcement basically keeps track of how people are, how individual doctors are prescribing. And so each of these copies was basically a letter going back to Sacramento saying, you know, I'm passing forward scripts. And I remember walking into this pharmacy and it was just me and the pharmacist. It was a Sunday morning. I should have told you something. Uh, and, and he knew that it was forged. And I knew that it, he knew that it was forged, and he knew that I knew that he knew that it was forged, and uh, and there was really nothing he could do. The paperwork was all, you know, in order. And I walked out of there with a little, you know, sandwich bag, brown paper sandwich bag, uh, with a little vial of Demerol in it. And as I was walking out of there, I was thinking, you know, eventually they're going to come and get me, <laughs> uh, and, and they did. Um, eventually they did. But today, I'm going to get hot. And that's addiction too. At some point, when I couldn't stop on my own, uh, I wanted <laughs> to die. I, I wanted things to completely blow up. And I think that that's also something that happens, is that there's a, uh, in some people with addiction, uh, you're just so desperate that you go ahead and use that extra amount that is finally the one that pushes you over that line of <coughs> And I think it's hard to really tell when you're looking at, a, at an opioid-related death, um, you know, was that just the person made a mistake or were they were just driven to such desperation that they didn't care? Uh, and, and I think that that's, uh, that's also part of the tragedy of addiction. And so these four patients, uh, they, they kind of remind me uh, of, of some of the most important features uh, of addiction. And so, like I said, uh, this is me when I was in, in you know, before I became addicted, uh, and then I had that, and, and lots of great flying. Um, and then uh, I became addicted to the opioids after the surgery. And uh, the, you know, as much as I tried to quit on my own, um, I just couldn't. Uh, I put together maybe a month or two months, but eventually I'd relapse and I'd forge another uh, triplicate prescription. And eventually the Navy uh, caught up with me uh, and they figured out what I was doing and they were, they were kind of pissed, as you can imagine. Uh, and they ended up sending me to their treatment center, which is called Leavenworth. <laughs> and I found myself sitting in the basement of our nation's maximum security military prison wondering, gee, how did this happen, right? Because I was never really a drug user in high school or college. I came to addiction fairly late in life, but it was bad and it got bad very, very quickly. Uh, and I, I hope you never find yourself in a correctional setting 
Um, but it's, you know, you find yourself sitting in the basement uh, and they didn't send me here first, they sent me here first. This is the Camp Pendleton Brig. Uh, it's a bit of a crisis of faith when an officer goes to the brig in the Marine Corps. And so they didn't want any of the other inmates there to know that I was there. So they cleaned out this entire cell block. I can't be entirely certain, but I think this was the window across from my cell. And the cell looked almost exactly like that. It didn't have a window. And I spent the next 90 days in solitary confinement. And uh, I gotta say, it, you know, it had an effect. I really do not recommend that you take mentally ill people and, and put them into this kind of setting. And most people who are in uh, uh, solitary confinement in the United States are not necessarily there for their behavior, they're there for administrative reasons. And I don't think that this is one of the things that we're gonna be proud of uh, in the future. Um, but I basically spent the first 90 days of my sentence and then I, then I went out to Kansas and I, I did a federal year. So that's 10 and a half months, you have to do 85% of your sentence uh, in the federal system. There's no parole or probation uh, in the federal system. Uh, and, uh, and then they, after 90 days, they took me out to Kansas. Uh, this is uh, back when TWA was still operating. So this is the year 1997. <laughs> So they basically, uh, it was three chasers and me. So these are chasers with extremely short hair and very ill-fitting suits, uh, and me in my white uniform shackled, uh, being taken through <laughs> San Diego and the St. Louis and the Kansas City Airport. And I arrived at the United States Disciplinary Barracks, Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, uh, the day before Thanksgiving, 1997. And I don't know if you've ever been to Leavenworth, if you get a chance, you should go. It's a beautiful base. It's really a showpiece base uh, for the Army. There's a general uh, staff college there. Uh, everywhere you look, you will find history. Uh, general Custer was court-martialed uh, at this facility. Um, you can't quite see it, but there's a bluff right here. Uh, and I know this bluff very well because I mowed it quite a bit. Uh, and it goes to the banks of the Missouri River. And if you look at the dirt, in that bluff, you can still see the ruts from the Conestoga wagons that were pushed up the hill here because the front door here is actually the beginning of the Oregon Trail. So I, I like to think that I went to the Harvard of prisons. I, uh, <laughs> I don't know where you went to prison, but I went to Leavenworth, class of 98. And so when I wasn't, you know, mowing grass, uh, I was basically sitting in a cell, and this is actually a picture of Alcatraz, but it looked almost exactly like that. I guess that was standard prison design 120 years ago. Uh, and so you have to just imagine me sitting in the cell wondering how the, how the hell did this happen? Because um, it really, you know, from my first unauthorized Percocet to, to, to Leavenworth was really only about 20 months. Uh, and, and probably one of the things that I found the most frightening was I knew that if they let me out, the first thing I would do would be to go use drugs. And I, I found that horrifying, and I found it very deeply shameful. And I also found it a little fascinating, and I really wanted to know, how is this possible? Is this a disease like people say it is? One of the things that really shocked me was, was just how badly I was craving and I really tried to, you know, the, the good thing about being in solitary confinement is that there's nothing you can do. So you can kind of do six experiments on yourself because uh, solitary confinement controls for confounding variables very nicely. Uh, and I would really try, you know, if I was in the midst of a craving, I really tried to think, what is this? Is this a thought? Is this a feeling? It feels very, very emotional. There's death. Definitely, you know, uh, 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 I'm going over in my head the actual physical uh, steps to use to, to inject drugs. Uh, so a lot of it was, you know, trying to, to imagine that uh, and recapitulate that, that act. Even, the, even I think, the, the position of the body when a person injects is part of uh, the craving that a person may feel uh, for the drugs that they're injecting. Um, but what would really shock me is that there was almost a grieving process when I, when I considered you know, having to live a life never uh, using drugs again. I didn't want to live a life if I didn't get to have that feeling uh, again. And so this is one of the things that really perplexed me. I really wanted to know how is this, this phenomenon of craving, which I think is the definitional symptom 
of addiction. Everybody around the person with addiction cares about persistent use despite negative consequences. The family, the job, the lawyers, uh, the, uh, the judge, uh, the Navy, the California Medical Board, they all care about that phenomenon of persistent use despite negative consequences, and they want to know why don't they stop. If they knew what they were risking, if they knew what could happen, they would stop, right? Well, no, because something has gone terribly wrong in the brain's value calculator. But for the person with addiction, this is the symptom that they care about, because that really represents the suffering, that intense ruminative, so over and over again, <laughs> extremely emotional, uh, uh, really, um, and, and most importantly, involuntary thought, emotion, you know, mood process surrounding the drug. And, and I really wanted to know what that was. And so the Navy had given me a little time off of work and a nice quiet place to study, and so I proceeded to try to find everything that I could uh, on addiction. And at that time, and again, this was the year 1997, the neuroscience of addiction was just starting to come together. There were still some big holes, things we didn't understand, um, but there was, there was one textbook, uh, it's called The Lowensome, and uh, my mother, who's also a physician, uh, drove over to San Francisco and bought me a copy and mailed it to the prison, and, and they said, hey, you gotta go down to the mail room, there's a package for you, and I got escorted down there. Uh, and they opened it up, and it's this beautiful book uh, with this picture of an opioid peptide uh, kind of in gold leaf on the cover. And they took one look at it, and they didn't want to give it to me. I guess they thought that I was going to make meth in my toilet bowl. <laughs> and the rest of it. But um, it was funny. He said, I think this needs to go to the printed you know, materials committee. And so he put this beautiful textbook on top of a stack of very graphic pornography that basically had to go through the printed, and it looked a little silly sitting, you know, on magazines, you know, Scout Masters on Uranus, that kind of thing. Uh, but but he, uh, he put it there, and it looked kind of dumb, and he grabbed a form, and as he started to fill out the form, he tore it. And so he crumpled that up and threw it away, and he reached for another form, and there were no more forms in his little bit. And he handed it to me, and he said, you know, take it, get out of here. And I took that back to my cell, and to this day, this is my most prized possession. Uh, I was allowed 10 books, uh, and this was, you know, one of them, The Basic Text of Alcoholics Anonymous, The Basic Text of Narcotics Anonymous, I think I had Living Sober, I had a number of books by Bill White, uh, but this thing, uh, to this day, is probably the first thing I'd grab if my house was burning down. It still has my inmate number on the inside corner. Uh, and, and when this book came out, uh, it contained Alan Leshner's uh, uh, editorial uh, that was titled, Addiction is a Brain Disease and It Matters. Uh, now, uh, he retired from his position as director of the National Institute of Drug Abuse and was, uh, her position was taken over by Nora Volkoff, who has had it now some 22 years. Uh, but this was a major, major statement at that time. Uh, that anyone was willing to go on the record saying that their, this behavior might actually be due to a brain disease. His, his uh, editorial has come uh, in for some criticism today. It's kind of a lightning rod, uh, but many of the things that he said there were very, very provocative, especially to a person in early uh, recovery, that there might actually be a reason behind you know, my behavior besides just you know, being a sociopath. Uh, and I, 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 did, I don't know, maybe it was part of my sociopathic makeup, but I didn't think I was a sociopath. Although it's a little hard to tell. You know, you're sitting in a cell, that's a very existential question. How do you know if you're not a sociopath? Because maybe that's the first thing a sociopath tells himself. Oh, you're not a sociopath. Don't even worry about it. Don't even think about it. Right? But I, I wanted to know, you know, how is it that I could lie and cheat and steal uh, if this is a brain disease? And when I opened that book, the wonders just spilled out. And with each page that I read uh, was the neuroscience of addiction. And over the last 20 years, uh, that neuroscience has grown and grown actually into this lecture, uh, which we will now do. But if I had to make a statement uh, about what I think addiction is, I would say that addiction is a disease of the human capacity of volition. And that's more than just choice. That's more than just agency. Volition is a process 
that the brain goes through when it weighs options, when it assesses value, when it actually executes a motor command, and when it sees what that motor command can do, and then there's a response from the world. And so these four patients that I told you about, they to me are examples of a very awkward term that I came up with, which is volitional juxtaposition. And what I mean by that is you've got something that's amazing that human beings can do, almost magic, right next to a complete and utter and incomprehensible and demoralizing inability, right? The surgeon can do anything in the OR, but he can't seem to reach this patient, right? Uh, and that's, to me, an example of volitional juxtaposition. And what that, that elderly gentleman taught me about addiction is that we will trade our bodies away for whatever it is, that degree of value that we have given to our intoxicant. And so what this means is that if we want to understand something like craving, we have to start with the brain, but we have to understand that the brain travels in the body. The fact that we have arms, the fact that we can inject a drug, all of that goes into that brain processing that is broken uh, in addiction. When I look at you know, that sailor uh, who has tried so hard to stay sober, uh, what he did not understand is that the United States Navy uh, actually had, you know, a few years before that, a program for sailors who got addicted to heroin. This is after, let's see, did I put this in here? Yeah, this is after the Vietnam War, uh, and during the Vietnam War, the military had a terrible, terrible problem uh, with uh, heroin addiction. Uh, and they were worried that all these people were going to come back from Vietnam to the United States and be addicted to heroin. Uh, so the Navy uh, did something very amazing. They took a, 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 a harm reduction treatment position. Everybody who left Vietnam gave a urine sample. And if that urine sample was, was you know, negative, you got to go back home. Uh, and everybody basically went home to my hometown which is Alameda, California. Alameda Naval Air Station was where everyone landed. So it's a crazy ass party, let me tell you. Uh, uh, people getting back and just letting loose. But one of the things that the Navy did is they actually teamed up with the producers of Hawaii Five-O, and I'm talking about the old Hawaii Five-O, and they filmed an episode about heroin addiction on board a ship. And Dano went undercover to basically try and break this heroin ring. And there's this one scene where Dano is trying to help a sailor who's going into withdrawal. And he says, listen, you know, if you get tested, you're gonna go to the brig. But the Navy has an exemption program and you can get treated and you can get an honorable discharge, but you gotta turn yourself in. And I look at this scene and I say, wow, what a great Navy. How the fuck do you get into that Navy, right? Because that's not the Navy that I was in uh, when I was in the Navy. And so the point that I'm trying to make here uh, is that very often uh, there is a system operating around the person with addiction. We tend to look just at that individual. We tend to shoulder the entire burden for recovery on that person. But there are systems that operate and this young man never had a chance. He never had a chance to stay sober because he didn't understand that the Navy had changed its policy. Now, for all I know, the Navy will change its policy back. And that's the problem with the drug war is that it tends to swing rather wide. Right now, we seem to be swinging into a, a period where drug use is more acceptable, even celebrated. Right? There are a number of very exciting drugs that might help with things like alcoholism or trauma. Certainly ketamine's uh, effect on treatment-resistant depression is, is amazing. We actually have a protocol at our treatment center. Um, but what I'm trying to point out here is that addiction is not just embodied, it's also embedded in a time and place, in a period of history. And it is not really possible to understand addiction unless you understand the historical context within which that addiction is taking place. You have to look at the country, the values, the laws at that particular time. And so I got addicted probably at one of the worst times uh, of, of uh, the drug war. We were at the very, very height uh, of our punishment. What I did not know, and I can sit here and make jokes about Leavenworth, um, about 
10 years into my lecturing, a couple people, uh, different lectures came up to me and said, you know, you're really joking about something that's very, very serious. And I'm like, well, I'm Irish. That's, that's what we do. Didn't you read Angela's Ashes? I mean, we take tragedy and we turn it into comedy. But what they were trying to point out to me is that I may not have thought it at the time, but I actually had a tremendous amount of protective privilege going into that carceral setting. I had other doctors that I had met who were in recovery. There was a, a hope for the future that I might be able to become an addiction medicine specialist myself. When I think back, I'm really quite moved about all the things that were protecting me as I went into that very, very difficult time. But you know, it turns out that Leavenworth is a pretty good prison. I didn't know that there were gradations of quality uh, among incarcerate, uh, incarcerate, incarcerial systems, but it turns out that the United States Army runs a pretty good prison. I tell people, if you ever need any personal corrections work done, I highly recommend the United States Army. They do fine work. I mean, I feel much better, right? <laughs> and so uh, what I did not see at that time, but I do now, is the privilege of being able to stand up here and make jokes about uh, uh, about an incarceration that for someone else has deep and profound and long lasting health consequences, mental health and regular health. Um, so it's important, I think, if we want to understand what a craving is, if we want to understand what addiction is, we really have to look at that moment in time. Uh, another example of volitional juxtaposition is uh, the example of an amazing country that can do things like send people to the moon or build a machine like an F-18 Hornet, right? But it has yet to figure out its very troubled relationship with the concept of liberty and who should have it and who should not. And my argument is, is that we will not be able to fix this drug war unless we finally face that trauma and process it and figure out what happened when the United States decided to use huge numbers of people and steal their labor. And then when that was not you know, allowed anymore, basically to start Jim Crow. And when that became too you know, unfashionable, to start the period of mass incarceration. We have gone through a few things as a nation in just the last weeks that I think are extremely important historically. And they really show that, that there's something about addiction that puts a very powerful tool into that person's hand. If you're suffering from trauma, if you're suffering from depression, and someone prescribes you Vicodin, you may be in that 15% of people who have such a tremendously powerful euphoric experience that you're almost guaranteed to become addicted. And how much of that, taking that, say, Vicodin, is euphoria, and how much of it is the relief of depression? is very hard, I think, to parse out. And so when a person has that experience, they recognize right away, I can put this to work. I can use this to cope, right? But there is something about addiction, something about volition that is so central, I think, to our concept as human beings, that when we see it start to fail in another person, as it often does in addiction, we feel an almost overwhelming urge to get in there and control that person. And when I look at two million people, I'm looking at violence. And my definition of violence is using more force than is necessary to get the job done. And so addiction operates at this extended level. The fact that we can put people in prison makes us put people in prison. The fact that we can use drugs and we don't have to really develop intimacy or uh, coping mechanisms, things like that, we're gonna turn to that drug, right? There was just a, you might have seen this, um, these two Democratic uh, State House representatives in Massachusetts who put forth a bill to allow people who are incarcerated to basically trade their organs for a reduced sentence. That's what I'm talking about. Uh, that is a deeply, deeply offensive idea. Uh, and the fact that they just so casually you know, celebrated uh, their law as getting rid of health disparities, I think really shows the level of just freaking craziness that we have adopted in trying to treat people with mental illness. And then lastly, you know, is this example of 
the fact that I was given a license, that I was given permission to practice medicine by the state of California, that I could do all kinds of things to help people. And what did I do? I turned it into you know, an opportunity to get drugs. Uh, that also is volitional uh, juxtaposition. Tremendous power put next to tremendous incapability. And, and what that tells me is that you know, there comes a point in my addiction, I don't care if I die. I deserve to die. And at that time, when I forged that triplicate and it over, of course I was going to commit suicide. I mean, especially after I got arrested. It would be in bad taste not to kill myself. Come on. And that, I think, is also addiction, is that, that you can be driven to such a level of despair uh, that because you simply can't do what other people can do so easily, right, uh, that, that it can lead you to do the ultimate volitional act which is to simply end your life. And that's this fourth idea, that volition is something that we enact. It's not just something that I think about, it's not just something that I want to do, I'm actually acting on the world. You know, motor command on the world, the motor command to inject myself with drugs. And there's a response back from the world. There's a response from my own physiology, but there's a response from, say, the law, when I have misused my volition. And I've tried, I've, you help me with this because if you can come up with something that I can't see, I wanna hear about it. I've tried to think, what is the single most powerful act of volition that an individual can do? And I can't think of anything greater than injection drugs. When you're talking about what it's like to be in craving, to be in trauma, to be depressed, and to be able to do something act on the world and have that incredible change that happens in seconds. That, once that's occurred, it's gonna be very, very hard to let go. It's gonna be very, very hard to turn to things that aren't quite uh, as powerful uh, as drugs. And so these four things are what are known as um, uh, four E cognition. If you wanna understand something like cognition, if you wanna understand something like craving, you have to start with the brain, yes, but understand that the brain travels in a body, that our consciousness is embodied. This is the whole idea of somatic experience, the idea that trauma is held within the body and that we need to get that out. Mindfulness meditation, uh, the, the consciousness and acceptance that goes along with dialectical behavioral therapy is trying to get people to listen to the signals that their body is sending to their brain that we are not typically conscious of. When we try to get sober, we often have to. We have to learn how to meditate. We have to learn how to listen to those signals and, and, and really you know, think about, okay, what am I experiencing right now, right? Even our breathing can make a difference, right? That consciousness is embedded in a certain culture, in a certain historical moment, that consciousness uh, uses tools or whatever affordances are available to it, right? And that consciousness involves a, an equilibrium with the world. I act, the world acts back. I act, the world acts back. And I think that this is, if we're going to understand addiction, we have to take this broader view uh, of what cognition or what emotions or what craving is uh, beyond just the brain. And so this is, I think, you know, uh, an important question. What is craving actually? What's going on in the brain when we have a craving experience? And I think we need to look, each of these patients, even big patients, <laughs> in public health, we, we still have old magazines. We just have 100,000 of them, right? Like, like other doctors, that's a little public health joke that we sometimes tell, it's not, not very funny. <laughs> but I think that addiction is a problem here. Once that person knows that they have a tool that they can affect such great change, either in the world or also in themselves, it's gonna be very hard to put that tool down and pick up healthier tools, right? And so when I talk about you know, volition, what I'm really talking about is a process that goes on in the brain, in the body, and in the world, right? Where I detect that I have a need, I understand what that need is. I go to a library of strategies from my past uh, that that you know might be able to be used to meet that need. Which one do I select? How do I enact a plan to get from here to the satisfaction of that need? That stepwise plan, right? What are my tools? 
is the reason that my mother has $20 in her wallet there because I can enact my plan? This is where I think um, you have this, as the brain shuts down and as the person becomes so focused on using drugs, people can start to become instruments. And they hate that. Families hate to be used by the person to get drugs. But the brain, once it knows where it wants to be and where it is right now, it will do whatever it has to do to shorten that distance, to use the fewest number of steps possible, and to use whatever is at its disposal to get the job done. So there's a getter done component uh, to, uh, to volition, right? What is the result? Do I actually get the effect that I was expecting? Do I get more effect than I was expecting? And what is the response of the world to the fact that I have used my volition in this way? I talk to a lot of people who are in trouble with the law, and they haven't quite you know, gotten to court yet. And they tell me, oh, I could never go to jail. Thanks. And I feel like saying, really? <laughs> <laughs> See that guy over there, the guy with the, you know, uh, arms folded? Uh, he's called a bailiff. And the door that he's standing right next to, there's about 12 more people just like him on the other side of that door. And if that guy or that woman standing at the top of the, or sitting at the top of that podium says, you will go to jail, you will, I trust me, you will go to jail. And they will bodily, if necessary, pick you up and take you there. And as they're doing that, as they lift your, as the power of the state is brought down upon your physical person, you might be angry, you might be sad, but the first thing you'll probably think is, oh, this is very impressive. <laughs> and that's, I think, something that people who've been in trouble with the law uh, understand, is that the state has unbelievable power to get what it wants done. And so if you use your volition in a way that the state does not want, it will act back, it will react, and it will also often react with more force than is necessary to get the job done. And so this process of volition is these different systems that are be using, it's kind of like a Rube Goldberg, remember those old Rube Goldberg cartoons where the person would do something and it would move you know, that, and the power would do something, and the end result was to wipe the guy's mouth with a napkin? That's kind of what volition is. It's one system after another system after another system after another system that gives us the ability to sense a need, formulate a plan, act on the world, see the result, and have the feedback from the world. Think about what happens when a person takes a chip in an AA meeting. That is a single act of volitional I don't know, practice, right? The sponsor stands up there and says, hey, this guy, He's worked hard. He did a lot of things that he didn't want to do, and I'm proud of him. And now he's got a year, and I want you to you know, help us celebrate and, 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 uh, and tell us how you do it. The guy stands up there and he says, I don't know how I did it. <laughs> I just I did what you guys did. I did what this church sponsor of mine says to do. And now I've got, for the first time in my life, 12 months. And so there's the person who was faced with a challenge. They met that challenge. They acted on the world. It worked. And there's a huge social recognition component. The clapping, keep coming back. Right? That is one volitional exercise that people do all the time in 12 step meetings. Set up the chair, make the coffee. Why don't you be the treasure for six months, right? These are all ways that people reconstruct their broken volition. But I hope it's clear that if something could go wrong at any of these steps, everything else could be working perfectly, and if one of them fails, then the whole thing comes crashing down. So volition is something that the brain and the body moving in the world do. It's the doing that becomes broken. In the same way that a person can't see light, or they can't walk, they have an injury, or they have a stroke or something like that, it is the capacity of volition that fails. And what we're trying to do, and I find this quite beautiful, uh, at our treatment center and at your treatment center and at the meetings that we go to, is help people reconstruct their ability to make choices that are really in accordance with their values. In the same way that a physiatrist or a physical medicine rehabilitation doctor can help someone regain function after an accident or after a stroke, we're doing that for the human will. I think that that's pretty amazing work. So now that I've kind of set this up and taken a long time, I really try to ask our patients, you know, try to think about 
what does it mean to have a disease of volition? Because one of the things that we have a problem with, uh, oh, I think, is we get a lot of patients with opioid use disorder. And we have, I think, worked very, very hard to construct uh, a process of inducing people on buprenorphine that is responsible, that is respectful of, you know, the 12-step abstinence-based principles that saved our lives, right? Problem is no one wants it. And so when that patient comes in and the doctor or the nurse sits down and says, wow, you've got a really serious opioid addiction. I mean, you've overdosed a couple of times and needed naltrexone. Maybe the patient has even spent a night on a ventilator in an ICU. We say, we have this medication. And to the extent that it is possible to know anything in medicine, we know that buprenorphine can decrease mortality. And it does a whole bunch of other things too, but it absolutely can decrease that person's risk of death in the next year. And when a patient says, I don't want to do that, I don't want to do that, I don't want to put anything unnatural in my body, I really want to come do this. <laughs> now I have the job of trying to figure out is this the act of an informed patient who's expressing their self-determination in their health care, which we will uphold not because we're nice people, but because it's a federal law? Or is this a disease of volition? That that person is just trying to leave the option in case all this recovery crap doesn't work out. <laughs> and I can run back to using you know, what I know really does work. Right? Uh, I want what you're saying to work, but I don't really have a lot of faith because nothing works better than drugs. right? So, no, I don't want to go on that buprenorphine. No, I don't want to take that extended release naltrexone. That's what a disease of volition is like. If there could be such a thing as a disease of volition, it absolutely makes sense to me that people, the first thing out of the patient's mouth would be, I can't do that, I won't do that. I refuse to do that. Yes, <laughs> that's what a disease of volition looks like. The person is failing in their understanding of what it is that they need to feel better. But a big task, I think a big task for all of us in recovery is to try to separate the world into those things that we thought we could handle and never really could and need to let go of. And those things that we can handle and that we need to take responsibility for. And isn't that the basis uh, of the serenity prayer? And these are the, the factors that I want our patients to think about. Well, what does it mean to not just have a brain disease, not just have depression or trauma, but what does it mean when your volition collapses? What will that look like? And so all of those systems that give us the ability to sense a need, name that need, come up with a plan, enact that plan, and then have a reaction back, right? That is, well, those are the areas of the brain that are involved uh, and that fail sometimes at the same time. Uh, in addiction, and we're going to go through all of this. Now, I should say this, in showing you this picture, I'm using a convention to describe the brain <laughs> called localization of function. I'm saying that the anterior cingulate cortex right here in the brain handles the capacity of social cognition, right? And I think that's a good place to start. That's a very good place to start. This is how neurology started. You all know the story of Phineas Gage, the guy who was a railroad worker, and he was tamping dynamite down, and the dynamite exploded, and it drove his big iron tamping bar through his skull. It went right through his orbital frontal cortex, and he got, he was okay. He actually survived, but he was a different person. His personality changed. It was these lesion studies that led us to be able to say, we think that this capacity is here. We think that reward is here, right? And I think that's a good place to start. We're gonna use that throughout this lecture. But what I wanna point out to you is that it's actually the pattern of activity and how these things work together that really define these capacities. And there is actually a form of magnetic resonance imaging that can measure the connectivity between these areas. It's called diffusion tensor imaging. And what it measures is the movement. All MR measures water molecules. DTI measures the movement of water molecules in three planes, in, in three dimensions, right? And since water molecules tend to move along axons and fascicles and bundles, you can get these very beautiful, quite artful pictures of the actual wiring of the brain. And the idea, kind of like the genome project, you know, lots and you know, millions of samples of people's genome to figure out what is the basic genome 
of a human being. This is the Connectome Project, where we scan millions of brains to find out the basic wiring diagram that you can expect to be in any one person's brain. And then the idea is, once we have that, we can scan this individual's brain, and the difference between the two may be major depression, may be trauma, may be addiction. And the good news about these connections is they're quite plastic. They can be rewired. And so a person could be engaged in treatment, go to meetings, things like that, and the pattern that we recognize as addiction can change into a pattern that we attribute more to recovery, right? So we're using localization here, but I want you to think about how the brain actually works and all of these different areas working together. All right. Um, okay, so when we're trying to explain addiction, there are different models that we can use, and there's a big list of these things. I'm a doctor, so I tend to use the medical model, but there are lots of other models. And what a model is, is a human-created representation of a natural phenomenon. It's not the thing itself. It tries to come very close to it. And that's why no model will be perfect. No model will completely fit reality as it is. And sometimes when you go from one model to another, you get better solutions, right? So there's one model that says that addiction is not a disease, it's more of a learned or learning disorder. And I think that there are people who have addiction and the entirety of their experience of addiction can be explained with that learning model. In fact, the learning model fits their experience better than it does the medical model, right? So whenever you move from one model to another, you usually get some benefits. You get greater explanatory power, right? But no model is exactly right. And so I think there are some patients for whom you can use certain models that are not what we use in medicine and get pretty far, maybe where you want to be, right? The medical model that I, that I was trained in really tries to look for the clockwork, the mechanism, what goes wrong behind the disease that the patient has. So these are, all moral, these are all models that have been used to explain addiction. We all understand the moral model. I'll show you how this works. You can use the moral model to describe syphilis. And it sounds like this. If no one has sex with anyone except their virginal married partner, then syphilis will disappear from the human population in one generation. That's basically true. <laughs> now, you know, syphilis is actually caused by a certain bacteria, right? Um, but the moral model can fit, and it can lead you to solutions that, you know, are not great, but they, they are kind of workable, right? For a long time, and this is what I was taught in medical school, is that people have addiction because they have a certain kind of personality. That is not true. There's no personality that predicts addiction, but people often use that. They often tell me, I kind of have an addict personality, or I kind of have the mentality of a person who might get addicted, and that's why I stay away from drugs, and I think that's very descriptive. The personality model has sort of you know, uh, grown and morphed over time to, to incorporate affect dysregulation and sensitivity for reinforcement and problems of impulsivity to become the neuropsychologic model that is often used. So when we're talking about cognitive behavior therapy, we're firmly within this model and it works quite well, right? So here's another model, the life course model of addiction. And this basically tries to look at the entire person's life and how that addiction plays out over time in that person's life. So here's a true fact. This is not something that we you know, trumpet from the mountaintop at our treatment center, but most people, especially young people who have drug and alcohol problems, with time will stop on their own. They don't go to AA, they don't go to treatment, as their life changes, as they start to get into their 30s and they no longer hang around the same crazy friends or maybe they move to a new town or maybe they have a kid or a job that they like, their social environment and their risk environment changes and they will quite passively mature out of their addiction. That does not always satisfy the parent of a 17-year-old who is using fentanyl. Uh, you can't say, well, by the time he's 35, he probably won't be doing this anymore. But there's plenty of evidence to support that, and it comes from this particular study called the National Epidemiologic Survey on Alcoholism and Related Conditions. This is a survey that is computer-guided, that is given to a large sample of Americans, and it's tied to the census. 
And so now I think there are four waves of data. The first wave, then 10 years later, the next wave, and 10 years later, the next wave. And what they found over time is that people who were using drugs, as you followed them forward and asked them, you know, are you still using drugs, they would, uh, quite a few of them would have stopped naturally on their own. This is this desistance idea that if you do nothing and don't screw anything up, the drug use will kind of peter out as the person gets older. I think that that's important. This is a very powerful study. It's run by the NIAAA. NIAAA. Um, it's, a, it's a very fine observational study. Here's the problem. Do you know how they figured out, or determined rather, if that person was still using heroin 10 years later and 10 years after that? They asked them. <laughs> you see the problem? <laughs> I don't know all the ways that my addiction continues to play itself out 20 years, 23 years into my recovery. So I'm not sure that Nisar has the sensitivity to pick up whether or not the addiction has just moved and is still active, right? And so that's something that we need to consider. But let's say that it's true, is that the most people over time will start to mature out. That fits the data better than the disease model. And there's a particular study that's been looking at uh, heroin addicts for a long, long time. And what Dr. Sir has found is that people sort of enter these trajectories. People who are using heroin, sometimes they're using a lot of heroin and over time they just get better and stop. Sometimes they stop almost immediately and then they're done, right? Some people get worse over time, and some people are pretty bad, and they just kind of stay pretty bad over the years and months, right? And this is what is called the life course model, is that people enter these different trajectories depending on what's going on in their life. And if we look at the entirety of the patient's life, then we can see how many people, many, many people, maybe even the majority of people, are kind of spontaneously stopping their drug use and their drinking uh, at that addictive level. Uh, on their own. So that's an important model. I can't, you know, disagree with that, right? The model that I was trained in is the medical model. What we call the neuro or the pathophysiologic model of addiction. And this emerged from the work of four doctors, Louie, Bobby, Rudy, and Iggy. And uh, two of them were, two of them were microbiologists, so the disease model owes its causal power to early bacteriology. And two of them were pathologists, actually looking at lesions in dead people you know, uh, who had certain diseases. Now, these ideas did not come together smoothly. This guy tried to have this guy thrown out of medicine for his ideas, right? But because their ideas were testable, they stood the test of time and they evolved into what we call the disease or the medical model. And if I could show you what it is, this is it. The disease model says you've got some organ or organ system, it gets a defect, a physical, cellular, or molecular defect, right? And as a result of that defect in that organ, you see certain signs in the patient and they will tell you about symptoms that they're having. I know that doesn't look like much. That is everything that we do in Western medicine. The next time you go to a hospital, look around, look at the tongue depressors, look at the MRI machine, all of it revolves around this model. In the short hundred years that we have been using it, it has doubled the human <laughs> lifespan. It's one of the most powerful causal models that has ever been discovered in science. And you can see how it works. If a person, say, has a broken leg, now a lot of people tell me, but a broken leg isn't a disease, it's more of an injury. Well, again, the doctors, doctors understand disease. The doctors who understand disease best are called pathologists. It's a five-year residency. <laughs> so it's as long as general surgery, right? And there's an old joke that, uh, that internal medicine doctors know everything but do nothing. Surgeons know nothing but do everything. And pathologists know everything and do everything one day too late, right? <laughs> so this is a very, very large fund of knowledge that it takes to become a pathologist. And what a pathologist will tell you is all disease is injury. It may occur on the gross level, where you can actually see a bone sticking out, or it may occur on the cellular level. But all disease at its, at its heart is an injurious process that the person has gone through. But when doctors were trying to figure out this new modern scientific model of disease, they could see how a broken leg fit it quite well. And you see what happens. You don't go here, you go here. You fix that, those go away, right? 
For diabetes, you don't go here, right? But all of those weird symptoms that don't seem related, they're all related back to that one defect in that organ. And if you replace the insulin, it's a little easier said than done, if you replace the insulin, all of these go away. So this model was very, very good for some patients with certain diseases. It was great for orthopedic surgery. It was great for endocrinology. It was great for infectious disease. But it was not as easy to see how brain diseases or psychiatric conditions fit this model. And so right around uh, 1910, there was a report that came out of Columbia University. And it basically said, you know what? We need to standardize medical education. We need to get rid of these diploma mills and have a standard education. And this is why they say that the person who graduated at the bottom of their class at the worst medical school in the United States is still called doctor, right? Because you can pretty much assume that the same curriculum at that bad school is what's going on at Harvard or Yale or any of these other things. There's a floor of competence that we don't drop, drop below. And the Flexner report said, we need to, as a profession, embrace this new, modern, physical, scientific definition of disease. And so they did, but it was not as easy to see how things like addiction fit this model. What was the organ in question? You know, some folks were saying it was the brain, some folks were saying it was the liver. They didn't know. What's the nature of the defect? The patent clue. And remember, the symptoms of addiction don't look like symptoms at first glance. They just look like bad behavior. And so when doctors could not readily fit addiction to the disease model as easily as they could these other things, they basically said that addiction is not a disease and that people with addiction are no longer patients. If you read the things that doctors wrote about people who were morphine or heroin habitues, addicted to opioids, in 1890 or 1900, they're completely different from what doctors were saying in 1920 and 1925. And when doctors walked away, that dumped the problem into the, criminal, into the lap of the criminal justice system. If we could ever show, excuse me, how addiction fit this model, if I could tell you the parts of the brain, if I could tell you the nature of the defect, if I could link that defect and that organ to the symptoms, then addiction would meet that standard. And for 100 years, we haven't been able to do that. Except when I got to Leavenworth, they were slowly starting to understand how this could be a brain disease, right? So I think one of the most important documents, if you're a person in recovery, you should have this document. This is an eight-page document that was published by the American Society of Addiction Medicine in 2011. It is a beautiful document. It summarizes the neuroscience of addiction very well, and I think it speaks quite eloquently to what it is that people with addiction go through and, and, and overcome, right? I'm very grateful if all of our families of our patients would read this, right? So we have this document. There was an update in 2019. This is a, just a plain language update. Uh, again, summarizes what it is that we understand. If you want a bigger um, example, or collection rather, of the important neuroscience, not only of addiction, but also of recovery, I would point to the Surgeon General's report that came out in 2016. It's a very, very, very important document, and it is your, my nation's position on addiction, and it contains as much information about people who are in recovery as it does about people who are in active addiction. But this is a complex book. It takes me a couple days to get through. And you can imagine, you know, if I'm lecturing to people who are five days sober and I put this graphic on the board, it doesn't make me a lot of friends, all right? <laughs> but everything that we're talking about is consistent with what you'll read in the Surgeon General's report. And once we had that, we knew the areas of the brain, we knew the nature of the defect, and we could link that to those symptoms, and addiction became a disease. And when addiction became a disease, something very, very important happened. People with addiction became patients. And patients have rights. They have legally defined rights. And so if you can't do something to a person with diabetes or cancer because it's unethical, or if you are required to do certain things for a patient with cancer or diabetes, then so too you, can you not for people with addiction and must you do for people with addiction. That's, a, I think, a much more subversive read of the argument for addiction being a disease. Because most of the time, doctors are making the argument because they want to get paid. 
right? They want to, you know, get billing. They want to be able to bill. They want to be able to get paid for their work. And I'm making a much more subversive argument, which is once addiction became a disease, we were obligated legally to people who were struggling with addiction. If we don't meet those obligations, then I think we can be sued. And that's part of my job at the treatment center that I work for. If we have a person come in and they are diagnosed with opioid use disorder and they spend a tremendous amount of money in 45 days in our program and they leave not on buprenorphine, I want to know why. I want to know what the reason was that patient did not leave our facility on the one life-saving medication that we know works. If we haven't done that, we could be sued. If we are culpable, especially if that person goes out and dies. <clears throat> this is what happened at Hazelden when Corey Montreef went to treatment at Hazelden, left, went to a hotel in Vancouver, used heroin, and died. It caused a deep soul searching by the staff at Hazelden to reconsider whether this, this lion of absence-based you know, treatment was going to work to incorporate medication for opioid use disorder. And they did the right thing, and every other treatment center must too. Not because it's the nice thing to do, it's because we are held to certain legal standards. And if a treatment center does not want to do buprenorphine, I understand, but they must have the capacity to be able to refer that patient to someone who does. If they don't, that is a tortious act and the person can sue for damages and recover those damages, right? So it, it means something to say that addiction is a disease. It's not just something that rolls off the tongue. There are obligations that go along with this. The problem is, is that medical model is not perfect. It tends to breed a kind of medicine that is very good at acute disease. It breeds a kind of medicine that is good at pills and surgery and delivered by professionals. And what primary care has tried to do over the last 20 years is become better at chronic diseases, which is the bulk of most diseases, and certainly the disease of addiction. What is the context, the cultural context, in which that disease is playing out? Does the disease come and go? Are there periods when the person is not experiencing the disease, but then in another time in their life they are? Do we take care of the patient over the entire range of their lifespan? Are we taking their values and their goals into account? And are we really reaching out to those resources in the community that could help us treat this patient with a chronic disease? And so the disease model is a powerful model, but it's not perfect, right? And this is the model that we're trying to move to. And so what I would say is that the disease model works for addiction, but it's very myopic. It deals with physical things. It can't understand what's going on when the sponsor and sponsee sit down and the two of them talk about what alcohol meant to them. But a public yeah. health model can take those things into account. It takes into account the ecology within which the disease operates. The public health model has all the causal power of the disease model, but it goes beyond to understand how faith-based organizations might be helpful in the treatment of the disease. What is the societal contact? What is the life course? How is the person's housing situation affecting whether they can manage their chronic disease successfully or not? So in making the disease model of addiction, I'm trying to open the door to the public health approach to addiction. And it has become fashionable of late to say that addiction is not a disease and yet advocate for a public health approach to addiction. In two months, I will have a newly minted master of public health. <laughs> if I keep my notes clean, right? I turn in a few assignments, right? <laughs> and so I'm not going to allow that. You cannot simultaneously advocate for a public health approach to addiction and say that it's not a disease because the entire structural foundation of public health <coughs> is that imperfect disease model. And so I understand these other models that are often used. They definitely have their power. If I'm not getting what I need from the disease model, let's try another model. And very often that model will suggest things that the disease model never thought of, right? But these are all ways, they're basically different approaches to the same natural phenomena, which is the phenomenon of addiction. 
And so there, the addiction is a disease with multiple etiologies. It's not just one thing that's happening. Sometimes there are multiple things that are happening to lead that person into addiction. So to have trauma or to be a person with major depressive disorder is to be at greater risk of addiction. Sometimes just knowing that makes sure that it doesn't progress. We're going to talk about most of these before we're done here tonight. But um, I think it's possible to take all of this neuroscience and summarize it in three sentences. These are three sentences that if you know, you know most of the neuroscience of addiction. And this is the first sentence. That addiction is, at its heart, a disorder in the brain's ability to perceive pleasure correctly. Addiction is a broken pleasure sense in the brain. In the same way that a blind person can't perceive light correctly, people with addiction cannot perceive pleasure correctly. And that appears to be primarily a problem in the dopamine system. But it turns out that dopamine is not pleasure. It handles very critical components of pleasure, but there's quite a debate over what it is that dopamine actually handles. And so we're going to nail that down. But it turns out if there's a defect in this system, it has major consequences for another system. And that's the system that we use to make choices. And this is why I say that addiction is a volitional disorder. You know, that dopamine defect, that affects the quality of my decision making, and not just my decision making, but also my ability to see that defect. There's a loss of insight component. So those are two important sentences to know. The third one involves the cause. What is it that breaks the dopamine system? And we know that the cause of addiction is not genes. We know that genes are important. They're a big part of the story. But it turns out you have to have something in the environment, something toxic in the environment that acts through that genetic vulnerability or resilience to create this dopamine defect and all that follows. And that's the real cause of addiction. Chronic, severe, repetitive, not normal, right? But poorly managed, early in life, maybe even transgenerational trauma and stress damage the dopamine system, which allows us to see how these other things overlap with addiction. That's a busy slide, but that's currently where the medical model is in its understanding of addiction. Addiction is a stress-induced, genetically mediated defect in the reward learning system that then causes impairment in executive functioning in the frontal cortex. Does anyone have any questions? This is a good slide to I feel like I'm just pummeling you with information. Nobody has any questions. That's a bad sign. Yes, sir. As far as the frontal cortex, uh, the frontal uh, lobes and right. stuff, which deals with the um, the emotional thing. What yeah. else? Um, well, I should say that more and more people believe that emotions dive down into the deeper limbic areas of the brain. And if we really want to understand all of, emotion, of an emotion, we have to look at the entire range of the brain. We can't do that division of the Apollonian frontal cortex and the Dionysian you know, gotcha. midbrain. Okay. So, um, so do you feel that um, while diving into the brain and understanding that process, if we really break away from the old standpoint that says we only use 10% of the brain right. and really understand that the brain is used at a bigger, broader spectrum, that right. we would truly understand that it's both our um, arena that we live in, our right. nurture versus nature. Yeah. yeah. Instead of it being versus, it is nurture in nature that changes our aspect of understanding the vision. Exactly right. So, really, if we want to understand the brain and how it's working, we have to understand how the body is communicating to the brain. Uh, when we say only 10% of the brain is working, that's because it's not. we're not factoring in what is my diaphragm telling my brain? What is my gut telling my brain? If I really want to be mindful of everything, or, or to be more mindful, right? I have to incorporate that as well. And this is why certain kinds of yoga, certain kinds of meditation are particularly helpful in people who are craving really try to analyze what am I feeling right now? Is it a craving to use or am I just hungry? Is this a craving to use or am I just angry or grieving, right? And so that's, that's part of it. Um, but we'll talk a little bit more about that, that the fact that we don't use the terms nature and nurture anymore. I'll go
go into that in some greater detail. On that same note, um, oh, yes, sir. Yeah. because you, you know, that's like the academic nature of all of that. Right. But I'm like that chocolate cake. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, only, I'm only thinking about getting that chocolate cake. So when you're talking about all these medical aspects of that thought process, right. My focus is the cake. That's right. Yay. And I'm saying I really love cake. Yes. That's some of it. But, <laughs> but <clears throat> that craving for that, I'm going to do whatever I need to do to make sure that I can justify having that cake. Right. I can run a little more. I could do this. But I could still have the cake. Right. And if we're talking about that, when you turn into, you know, opiates and everything else. Yes. We have that same mentality. That's exactly at right. Times like that. There's a drug called naltrexone. It's an opioid blocker. It's the brother or the sibling of naloxone, which is the drug that you give to try to reverse an overdose. People on naltrexone, their opioid system is completely out of the game. And they crave alcohol less. They crave gambling less. If they do relapse, they gamble less money or drink fewer days before stopping. But here's the problem with naltrexone. All the research is really not for the pill, it's for the 30-day shot, right? So that's a problem because the shot is expensive. But it doesn't work as well in everybody. And so sometimes you're talking about, you know, this medication extended release now tracks on with the patient, and they're like, well, is this really gonna work for me? Because I know some people who really had a reduction in their craving, and I know some people it didn't do anything. One of the fast and dirty ways to figure out if extended release now tracks on is going to work in this patient is to ask them if they have a sweet tooth. Because people who have a propensity for sweets, really enjoy sweets, they're more likely to respond favorably to naltrexone. That's because your opioid system and my opioid system kind of went in a certain direction, right? My wife, uh, she's Swedish and, and uh, she doesn't like candy. <laughs> And she says these weird things. She says, I don't really like sweet things. And I'm like, what, what are you saying? These words, they come out of your mouth, they don't make any sense, right? And she doesn't like sweet things. And I just, I can't even conceive of a life of not being able to enjoy sugar. And that is the drug that, if I don't get a handle on it, will eventually kill me. Not opioids, not alcohol, not cocaine, it my behavior surrounding sugar. And so it's interesting to think What's going on in the brain when I have that pleasurable experience? How is the brain doing young? And I will tell you, I spent an entire day going through stock photos of chocolate cake to find the most delicious piece of chocolate cake. This is the winner out of hundreds and hundreds of slides. It looks pretty good to me, right? But it's that yum that's failing in addiction. It's all those systems that go together that allow me to have a normal, pleasurable experience. They're not working. And that could be partially because I was born with a certain kind of dopamine system, and that put me at risk of addiction. Or I may have gone through some kind of trauma. I was born normal, but I went through some kind of trauma, and that changed the development of my dopamine system. So my ability to enjoy pleasure normally depends on the first 18 months of my life and whether or not I had safe housing and secure attachment and, and good food and things like that. Uh, if you want to really reduce addiction, you pay attention to the first five years of that child's life. There are all kinds of things that you can do to lower the burden of addiction later in life. But this is why I find this so fascinating. Something is going wrong in something that's so central to our experience as human beings that, that it's hard to really kind of think about well, what would a pleasure defect look like? Did I answer your question, sir? Yes. Yes, uh, yes sir. I think. If you, have a, if you have a question, if you raise your hand, we'll come to you with a mic. We're going to do questions a little later on, too. Okay. That allows the people the recordings to get as well. So I'm coming to you. And, and uh, Casey and I will hold the mics. You guys can speak into him. Got it. Yeah, so the question was, um, you talked about a broken dopamine system. That right. does not necessarily mean not enough dopamine, correct? So um, there's an addiction medicine psychiatrist, an addiction psychiatrist in New Orleans named Howard Wetzman. He's got one of the finest understandings of addiction. And he 
says that some people were born with an underfunctioning dopamine system either at the synthesis level or at the receptor level. And so it could be that a fair number of people already had a problem in their dopamine system and it kind of made them fertile soil for the day that they finally tried a cigarette or the day that they took their first drink or the day that they had their first joint. I think a lot of people are perfectly normal, but because they endured some trauma, that knocked their dopamine system out of whack and made them much more risk. So they weren't at risk, then they became at risk. I think there are some people who have no trauma, they were born with a perfectly normal dopamine system, but they were just intoxicated so much and so intensely that that caused the kind of stress that could break their dopamine system. And, and we talked about this a little earlier today. When I graduated from medical school, what we did in this country was expose almost the entire population of young Americans to extremely potent opioids that we were not using when I was in medical school. Fentanyl was not on the street. You used it in the OR, that was it. But now there's a fentanyl lollipop, there are fentanyl patches. And what that did is it didn't get everybody addicted, it just reached into that group who were vulnerable and pulled them out. So I think that's a good idea, is maybe you came into the world with a certain kind of dopamine system, you didn't come into the world addicted, but you were kind of ready for it when, when alcohol finally came into your life. <coughs> Potentially, but more from the medications that you're using to treat your Parkinsonian disease. I can't give tyrosine or tryptophan and boost the level of dopamine in my brain because I can't even take dopamine because it won't cross from my blood into my brain. I have to take levodopa, which does cross and then bring converts it into dopamine. So really, what we need is a list of the dopamine Trojan horses, the drugs that can get into the brain and fool the brain into releasing its own dopamine. I'm going to go kind of fast here. I'm not going to do all uh, 250 slides, but what is a list? I'll get to that joke later. <laughs> what is a list of all the things that can get into the brain and releasing and release dopamine? Uh, give me a break here. That's it. That's a list of all drugs, whether they're uppers or downers or strong or weak, that can get into the brain and cause the inappropriate release of dopamine in the brain. You'll notice it's also a list of drugs that cause addiction. If I came up with a new drug that could do that, I'd have to jam it in there. Now, that's how people become chemically addicted, but it turns out normal pleasurable behaviors can be manipulated and practiced into intoxicants. And so that's what gives us a much broader understanding of what could actually constitute an intoxicant or what could constitute an addiction. Almost always what I see is a primary drug and some behavior that is paired with it. I would say 99.9% .9 of cocaine and methamphetamine use in men, this can happen in women, but it's more uniform in men, is about that. And so if we don't treat both of them, then the risk is they'll just bounce off of Yes, ma'am, you had a question. Oh, 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 who's next? Okay, I was curious, um, you talked about the dopamine receptors and how they take damage and stuff. Is there a point where... Can you just hand her the microphone? Yeah, oh. can, can you turn her mic up just a little bit? Um, so when dopamine receptors take damage and everything right. like that, is there a point where um, you're, you can have like irrefutable damage to those receptors and you then are, you come to a point where you do actually need the medical intervention, at least not necessarily, you know, something at a drug, but... Um, right, you're right, like it's a very, very good question. So if I were to go to look at that map of the dopamine system, I'm going to go back here just a little bit. So we, we looked at this earlier today. This is the dopamine system, right? So this pathway here, this is the first part of the brain that's active when the brain begins the generation of that young, right? Is this yellow arrow right here. It's this synapse here. 
and the amount of dopamine, how much and how fast it comes on, is what begins that value calculation, right? And so uh, what drugs do and what uh, behaviors that have been manipulated into intoxicants do is they cause this big spike of dopamine. Too much, too fast. Brain isn't designed for that. It's designed for normal pleasures. That spike of dopamine is toxic. Now, some drugs work directly on the synapse, like cocaine and methamphetamine. Other drugs come through a back door, but they still cause that spike of dopamine. Behaviors, too, can be put on this list because they work through these intermediate chemicals and do that. We talked about how naltrexone blocks opioids, the opioid input to this, and it stabilizes dopamine downstream. The reason that that spike of dopamine is toxic, we talked about this earlier, is that it's toxic to dopamine receptors. And so this is the basic defect. By the way, this is Nora Volkoff's work. She's the current director of NIDA. This is the basic defect of addiction. It's too few of these dopamine receptors. So in a sense, it's not a problem in the song. It's a problem in the ear. It's a gain issue, right? The gain is set too low in people who have too few of these receptors. So this is a normal person. They have plenty of dopamine receptors. They have normal pleasure function. They've not been addicted to drugs. They've never been exposed to trauma. They don't have depression. This is the person who does have depression or has been a victim of trauma or was a, a child with ADHD that became an adult with ADHD or is in active addiction or is in early sobriety. So to answer your question, do these receptors come back? Yes. <laughs> They do, that's the good news, right? If all I do is take out that spike of dopamine, if the big treatment at you know, our program was to simply handcuff people to a radiator and bring them jack in the box three times a day, right? merely by the fact that they're not using drugs, you will see these receptors correct. When you put a program in there, when you put treatment you know, for trauma in there, it happens even faster. In fact, these receptors bounce back so quickly that it actually creates a clinical issue. And you see it in our young adult program, right? They come, they're very severely addicted. We get them through detox, usually put them on buprenorphine, and then they're in treatment for about two weeks. And then about day 15, they come to group and they say, hey, you guys are great. And, uh, and AA uh, at recovery is great. And this treatment program is great. I have to go. I have to leave right now. I'd love to stay. I can't. The job, the family. This is not about using drugs. It absolutely is about using drugs. This is not about using drugs because I'm going to go to a meeting as soon as I get home. So if I could get a ride to the airport, that'd be great. This person has bounced back so quickly that with that comes the overconfidence that they've got this, that they don't need that AA stuff. Right? And so if anything, it's the fact that these receptors do come back that can actually create its own set of problems. But if I do two things, I take out the intoxication, this is important. I can't move from heroin to cannabis because that spike of dopamine will still be there. I mean, I've made some improvements. I can't you know, die from cannabis, but I can't expect these receptors to come back. But if I remove all intoxication and, and this is important, put normal pleasures back into the picture, then I can reliably expect that these receptors will come back and I should regain normal hedonic function within the first, let's say, six months of my recovery. Some people it takes a little longer, benzodiazepines, people have been on methadone for a long time, might take a full year, but most of our patients they will be able to enjoy normally pleasurable things when they do normally pleasurable things because their receptor population has bounced back. Now we could use medications, right? But we kind of have to come around the back door. You know, it, it's in, you know, if this person is experiencing the impulsivity of ADHD and I'm worried about them relapsing back on meth, I may be tempted to give something like Vyvanse or Adderall or something like that. The problem is, is that those drugs release too much dopamine too quickly and that can cause relapse. But I may be able to use a drug like buprenorphine. If this person is addicted to opioids, that will stabilize their, their uh, dopamine release downstream right, and allow those receptors to come back. Or I could use a drug like bupropion, which is a stimulant. It's often you know, known as an, an atypical antidepressant called Wobutrin, or a nicotine secession medication called Zyban. 
And what it does is it just produces a little trickle of dopamine. Not so much dopamine that it causes mood alterations, but just a little bit. And that can sort of put scaffolding under the system so it'll heal quicker. But probably the, the most important thing is that that person in early recovery set aside time where they're engaging in normal, healthy, pleasurable activities. Do you guys have a sober softball league here in, uh, in Myrtle Beach? Start one. Very, very important, very, very important resource in the community for people in early recovery to be able to use to speed this healing. Did I answer your question? Yes, sir. Did I leave anything out? No. Okay, good, good. Yeah, and that's, that's, that's the good news, is that these receptors will come back. There's a, is there another question right in front of you there that has a question that signaled to me, and then I've got one over here. There you go, right there. How's it going? Good evening. Good. I was wondering, would naltrexone affect your endogenous opioid system? Good question. Right? Heroin addicts don't have much, but at least they have heroin, right? And then we took that away too. And so that's that kind of the first thing that occurred to me is how much of normal hedonic response are you blunting because you've taken normal opioid response out of the picture? it doesn't seem to affect normal hedonic activity. What it seems to affect are excursions. Too much, too little. It kind of squashes that down. And so it, see, it, it, it does not appear now that it's one of the symptoms of this medication can be a feeling of depression. And if you talk the person through that, by the time they get the next shot and the next shot, that should start to be going away. Uh, but their normal ability to feel normal pleasure should not be blunted, even though you are kind of blunting their opioid system. Uh, just to follow up, would that not prevent you from being able to get a runner's high from endorphins or? I, I don't think so. so. So this is interesting. So it turns out that naltrexone has been shown to decrease cravings for alcohol, decrease cravings for gambling. It can also stop cutting behavior, right? Non-suicidal self-injury. So there's a wide range of people that can be helped by taking the opioid system out of the game. It has also been shown to decrease nighttime sugar eating. And that is, you know, my thing, right? And so I convinced my doctor, like any good drug addict, I convinced my doctor to give me the naltrexone tablets. And so I was taking this 50 milligram naltrexone tablet every day. And this is what I can tell you. It works. It doesn't take away the habit but it takes away my interest. So I still found myself sort of mindlessly getting up at 10 p.m. and going to get another popsicle from the refrigerator. But my interest in the popsicle was gone. And with a well-placed sticky note on the freezer, I could kind of remind myself, make myself mindful to say, oh yeah, I'm trying not to do this, I'm trying not to do this. So what I find interesting about naltrexone is that it doesn't you know, fix the whole thing, it just takes away this one part and makes it a little easier for me to follow through with my original goal of not eating sugar at night. <coughs> and so in some ways, naltrexone is a decisional support medication. The patient makes the commitment to stay sober, and the naltrexone doesn't keep them sober, but it helps them do the things that can keep, that can keep them sober, which I find very you know, strange. It, it kind of takes away this just one part of that you know, nighttime eating. Does that make sense? No. Did you say that uh, victims of trauma who have sustained receptor damage in this system, uh, when the trauma is dealt with, they can regenerate the system very quickly, very quickly? Is that what I heard? That, that's the hope. So, um, so there's, like I said, there's been a lot of conversation about what does dopamine actually handle? And it turns out that one of the things that releases dopamine is not just intoxication, but trauma, right? And so this is, I think, the best way to understand this particular symptom of addiction, right? We talked about this. This is the one that gets everybody so upset, is to look at what's going on in that early dopamine system. So if you look at the neuroscience of addiction, you're gonna very, very quickly encounter the Olds and Milner study. This was done in the 50s, and this is the study that showed that if you allow a, a mouse to self-administer an electric shock, to a particular area of the brain, he won't do anything else but that. He won't eat, he won't drink, he'll just do that. Even if he stands on an electrified grate, he'll do that until he dies. And so this was the study that showed us that there were pleasure centers of the brain 
and that electric current and, it turns out, drugs can seem to hijack the system. Then a study came out that was a very, very clever study that put a probe into those areas of the mouse's brain. It was a double board probe and it released the drug through the middle bore and then very quickly sucked up whatever fluid was there through the outer bore. And what they noticed is when drugs were released, it seemed to cause these spikes of dopamine. And it turned out that every drug acted like cocaine and methamphetamine at that part of the brain. So alcohol act like that, nicotine act like that. And so this was the basis of that dopamine hypothesis that eventually got us to that, that list that I showed you. So what does dopamine actually do, right? Well, it kind of grabs my attention and zeroes me in and tells me this thing that I just came across is important for survival. This guy's research at the University of Michigan showed that dopamine was not a liking chemical as much as it was a wanting chemical. So it sort of sensitized wanting and future wanting of the drug. Um, but what the, most of the research showed is that that spike of dopamine is coding for a phenomenon called reward prediction error. In other words, if I think something's gonna be pretty good, and then when I do it, it's better than expected, that's what dopamine codes for. So if I'm standing in a vending machine, and I wanna buy a bag of Funyuns, <laughs> and Funyuns cost a dollar, and I put in my dollar, and I get two bags of Funyuns, that's dopamine, right? It's a reward, but it's better than expected. My brain says, hey, look at this, we're expecting one, we got two, we got two. Pay attention to this, this is important, this might be really good for survival, right? Why don't you put this thing a little higher on the survival priority list? And so it's not that dopamine handled pleasure, it handled these particular components of pleasure. And so you have to think about the person who's addicted to heroin, and they tell you, I'm using heroin, I don't really get high anymore, I'm just trying to stave off withdrawal. But there was that one time, and in the early days, where it just worked perfectly. It could be that they're misremembering how good that moment was, because dopamine is the chemical that tells me that this is actually better than it actually is. What has recently been found, and this is what I think will answer your question, is that dopamine isn't just released with rewarding things, it can also be released when the brain faces a trauma. And so dopamine is not a good chemical or a bad chemical. In fact, this particular study showed that dopamine actually was valence independent, right? And so trauma releases dopamine just like an intoxicant would. And so what I'm saying is this, at this early level of brain processing, before the signal reaches the amygdala, and the amygdala gives that first coding of emotion and then sends the signal on up, the brain can't tell the difference between trauma and intoxication. They're the same signal. And so when we really make a list, I made this list of what actually does dopamine handle, and I call this the ends of dopamine. It certainly handles things that are rewarding and things that are you know, motivating, but it also handles things that are noxious. It even handles things that are neutral. It also handles things that are almost there. How many of you are cooking? Well, I won't ask that. If you're a cocaine addict like me, did you experience this? It felt like every time I used cocaine, it was like trying to hit a nail with a hammer, and I would just miss the nail. And I would just miss the nail. And I'd be like, I know I'm going to get it this time, and I would just miss it. That's what dopamine does. And so if I get close to the thing, that releases dopamine. So we have a program for men with sexual compulsivity issues, and I've listened to these men very carefully because they have something very important to say about addiction. They will tell you that it's not the actual sexual conquest that they care about, right? Because they know that the minute the orgasm is over, they've got this molten wall of shame that's kind of hit them, right? What, where they actually get high is in the lead up, is in the fantasy is the imagining of what it's gonna be like. The brain is releasing dopamine. The person has not actually engaged in the behavior. You see this in cocaine addicts too. They'll tell you, I'm not really getting high from the cocaine anymore, but it's the getting it. It's the getting the guy on the phone. It's the scoring. It's the having the eight ball in my pocket. I'm driving home, I'm already high. There isn't a single molecule of cocaine in my bloodstream, but my brain, knowing that I have had the cocaine in my hand and still fucked it up, right? It needs to prime the pump and make sure that I actually complete the thing. So we can make a list of all those things, and on there is trauma. 
So in a sense, every severe moment of intoxication, shooting heroin, shooting cocaine, drinking you know, alcohol like, uh, like Nicolas Cage in, in, uh, in that movie, right? That is a little mini trauma. That's a little mini trauma. And so that has created a very dangerous, emotional, laden memory with lots of cues that is going to continue to protrude into my consciousness unless I get treatment for it and basically reprocess that memory. That's what EMDR does. It tries to bring out the emotion of the traumatic memory and put the traumatic memory back into some context. I think that that's what we do when we sit down with our sponsor and work the steps. We're basically reprocessing a lot of these semi-traumatic memories of intoxication. Yes. Did you just, did you just mention EMDR? Yes. So EMDR is a form of exposure therapy. Right, exactly. You're exposing that person to the thing that they're traumatized, but you're doing it in a very controlled setting. You're using this bilateral stimulation that nobody really knows why it works, but it seems to work. And that you're basically taking your traumatic memory, and think of them as shoeboxes on, on a shelf. You're taking the traumatic memory out, you're taking the emotion out of it, you're putting some fair context, so this would be cognitive behavioral component of this, back in. You know, I was doing the best I could with what I had at that moment. And then you're putting it back on the shelf. And it no longer has the power to protrude into one's dreams, to protrude into, you know, uh, to overactivate the sympathetic nervous system. And so I think in a sense, we've got to do this. Those of us who are addicts but don't have trauma, we kind of have to do the same thing. Because we live with the burden of those past moments of intoxication, which are acting a little bit like traumatic memories. Yes, I am. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Great. Was there another question? So this is my, my latest contribution, the ends of dopamine. <laughs> Keep in mind, things that are numerated also release dopamine. So they don't have to be very rewarding, but if they're numerated, like the numbers of posts or likes to your social media post, that can be part of this thing. And that's what gets social media on this list. There's a very, very fine book, I highly recommend it, called Dopamine Nation by Dr. Anna Lemke at, at Harvard. It's my current go-to book to explain dopamine. I highly recommend that you take a look at that book. Yes, sir. Um, yeah, as far as um, the dopamine, uh, I think you said the, uh, the medication. Please forgive me if I slaughter. No, not at all. Uh, Metraxel, or, or would you say it was called? Oh, naloxone. Naloxone. Okay. Yes. Well, medications dealing with the um, the addiction side of things and whatnot. Um, do you feel that if we would really dive more into the John Piaget's uh, uh, classical conditioning, right, and understanding that if we can take a positive behavior. Yes. And, and replace the addiction with the positive behavior. Right. And give them that sense of, hey, every time you're doing this, right. here's the reward yes. uh, with the operative conditioning, that we can also curve it with the medication and not have to worry about the uh, enzyme substrate reaction. You right. can place that new enzyme, sort of say, into place to reduce the reaction rate. Yes, yes. So do you feel like that, that can actually be a more beneficial way when it comes to therapy? It could be. The problem is, is that the amount of dopamine that's released is so great that it's hard to come up with another pleasurable thing that can hold a candle to it. When I was in my early days of recovery and craving a lot, I shot a lot of water because I didn't want to shoot drugs. I just wanted to go through the mechanical act, the ritual, and experience those cues, the flash, all of those things, because I thought that exposure without reward, you know, no drug, it's just water, would stop the craving. It, it made it worse. <laughs> it made it worse because when we have a pleasurable experience, like going back to that, uh, let me show you, going back to that young, right? The first part of my brain that's active is this unconscious midbrain, the survival midbrain. So when my brain comes across something that it recognizes as good for survival, it wants to tag that thing and it uses dopamine to do that, right? And so dopamine is released and it's the first in a cascade of chemicals. Now what you and I think of as young, right? Grandma's delicious chocolate cake needs all of these downstream chemicals, right? 
but I can take that yum and deconstruct it all the way back to dopamine. And what dopamine does is it grabs my attention, it zeroes me in, it tells me this is important for survival, pay attention to it, good or bad, right? To answer your question, the next thing that the brain has to do is lay down a memory of that thing. And not just the thing, but everything that went along with it at the time that I ate it, the people I was with, the sights and smells of that moment, even the angle of the sun in the sky <laughs> becomes part of that memory. And so what happens next is the dopamine, excuse me, the glutamate system works with dopamine to create these extremely potent memories of the drug and all the cues that went along with it. So if, if I stay sober for months and months and months, and then I'm exposed to that time of day, to that exit on the freeway, to that friend that I used to use drugs with, right? That can cause cue-induced relapse, and I'm not entirely aware of it, right? So what you're talking about has been shown to work. You're basically taking classical and operant conditioning that are too strong and trying to di displace it, right? Put other things in there. And I think to some extent that that can work. And if it can give the person some relief, it should. This is really the shit shadow law that I'm going to smoke and I'm going to get the crap chopped out of me, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and it does work, but then it fades. And the problem is, is that these memories are so strong that, that they're really some of the deepest and most enduring memories that the brain is capable of creating. And so it's, it's hard to displace them. But what I can do is I can stay sober. I can work a program. I can put days on top of days, weeks on top of months, months on top of years. And since those memories are not being reactivated, they don't drive my behavior as intensely. But in those early days, Going back home after treatment is highly, highly risky. And I tell our patients, the first 72 hours after you leave here is a time that you have to have every hour planned out. You're flying home, with whom are you flying home? Because a lot of people do great here and they get on the plane and they drink on the plane right home. Not because they didn't want recovery, not because they can't get sober, it's that they didn't understand the power of those cues. And so if a person can get that foothold, you're going to a meeting, what meeting? Where is it? How are you getting there, right? What, what's the next meeting you're going to? What's the next meeting after that? And if that person can get that foothold, that 72 hours of sobriety back home, and have in their phone a list of, say, three or four other alcoholics that they can call, then the person has, has established that foothold. But a lot of our patients don't do that. And, and they're, not, they're not getting that conditioning that's associated with recovery. They're just leaving themselves open to the conditioning that is still there from before they went to treatment. Does that make sense? Yeah. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I think that's a clever thing. It's just shoot water. <laughs> and it, it did not work. <laughs> Trust me, it's a terrible idea. <laughs> Craven got worse. <laughs> Hi, um, I have a question about the nalox, naloxone right, yes. and the other pubes that you were talking about. Um, do you feel that it's something that, okay, from my point of view, I see it as just a replacement for the drugs that somebody's opioids that people are addicted to. Right. But do you feel that it's something that they should eventually get off of? Or, or, you know, like, sure. this is not a lifetime thing, no. right? Is, is there like a, um, a time frame for people to stay on this stuff? So, so you've got three questions in there. Let me take the first one. Okay. Now, Trexone, as an opioid blocker, is not intoxicating. It doesn't get you high at all. Right. There's another drug that we sometimes use to treat opioid use disorder, and that's buprenorphine, right? I showed you my... Um, a little list here of those chemicals. Give me just a, give me a quick break. <laughs> that was a funny joke. Too bad we're not going to do it. Oh, well. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it wasn't that funny, really. So I showed you this list. Come on, for crying out loud. This list, OK? I tried to come up with a visual way of understanding that even though some are uppers and some are downers and some are behaviors, they're all doing the same thing because they all end in dopamine. 
right? And I was looking at that thing from high school chemistry, and I came up with this periodic table of the intoxicants, right? So the class that you're talking about are the green ones here, the opiates and opioids, right? They are the classic narcotic pain relievers, and as you go from left to right on my chart, the drugs either become more potent or more light, therefore more intoxicating. And so at the high end here would be the fentanyls. At the low end would be a drug called buprenorphine. And that's a drug that we sometimes use to treat opioid use disorder. Now, naltrexone isn't up here because it doesn't release dopamine. It's not an intoxicant. But buprenorphine, even though it's a much weaker opioid, if you and I were to just sit down cold and put a Suboxone strip under our tongue, we would notice some intoxication. But because of the special properties of the buprenorphine molecule, it's different from all other opioids, it can be used as an effective treatment for opioid use disorder. And so what we do is we give this medication and the person takes it every day and they are, in a sense, tolerant. If they stop, they will go into withdrawal. If they use too much, they might notice some you know, intoxication. But if they're on a stable dose, that decreases their craving, it makes it easier for them to stay sober, they're, they're, they're more likely to participate in things like AA. And of course, there is that mortality lowering effect. I think that some people will be on this medication and they derive such a benefit from it that it really makes the argument, why would we stop it? Because what we know is that when a person stops buprenorphine or when a person stops methadone, their mortality rate spikes. Then it starts to come back down again. But you're taking on all that risk. And I think it's, it's quite, why do you want to stop this? Is it pressure from someone else? Is it something like that? What most people will say is, yeah, I just think nine months is good enough and I want to stop. And I think that patient should be worked with. But they're going to have to bring all the other aspects of their program up to 120% to protect them in that early time when they're weaning off and when they're not taking it. If they get that kind of care, then I believe that doctor and patient working together will come up with the right amount of time for that particular patient. Sometimes that will be measured nine months, 10 months, sometimes it'll be nine, 10 years. It's gonna be different for almost every patient. But we don't consider the taking of naltrexone to be addiction because I'm not getting high, I'm not lying, I'm working with the doctor, and so all of those things are consistent with recovery. I'll say one more thing about buprenorphine. We get a lot of patients who um, come to our treatment center with opioid use disorder, and either their parents or they, when we bring up uh, buprenorphine, say, I can't take that because I used to abuse it. I used to get it from my dealer. I don't like the term abuse. What I would say is that person was non-medically using their buprenorphine. But people use buprenorphine non-medically for fundamentally different reasons than they would use Oxycontin or heroin non-medically. Most people who are taking buprenorphine non-medically are trying not to go back to heroin. They're trying to decrease their cravings. They're trying to wean themselves off of heroin. And so the reasons that people use buprenorphine are all fundamentally consistent with treatment. And what we know is that if a person comes to a doctor and wants to enter medication for opioid use disorder, they want to work with that doctor to take the dose of buprenorphine that's right for them, and they have a previous history of non-medical use of buprenorphine, not only is that not a contraindication, it actually predicts better outcome when the person finally enters formal buprenorphine treatment. And so when a parent says, well, he abused that, I was like, you know what? Let's just ride this out because actually previous abuse predicts better outcome when the person actually goes on it. So I think it's what we consider. I think doctor and patient working together, as long as I'm being honest, as long as I'm not you know, doing something weird, as long as I haven't started up another intoxicant, right? that's consistent with recovery. Now, if I'm going to several doctors and I'm lying about the fact that I'm also using benzodiazepines uh, or I just gave a fake urine, that's a problem. But when a person is stable on buprenorphine, you tend to see less of those duplicitous behaviors that are really what I think defines addiction. And so that's why this medication is so helpful. Um, 
because it really can be the tool that the doctor and the patient are using together to be able to get through that early part of their recovery. And not only is buprenorphine not harmful to a person's AA behavior, there are two studies that show that when a person is on buprenorphine, it's not that they experience less social phobia, but they're more likely to engage in social challenges. And the big social challenge when you're early in your sobriety is asking someone to be your sponsor. So people on buprenorphine are more likely to do that. And having done it, they're more likely to have satisfaction in having met that social challenge. So to my AA brain, what that means is buprenorphine doesn't in interrupt my AA behavior, it actually improves my willingness. It makes me more willing to go to meetings, to get that sponsor to work those stupid steps. And so I don't think that we have to consider buprenorphine and the 12-step abstinence-based recovery that saved my ass, right, to be inconsistent. They can be used together. Did I answer your questions? Yes. Great, great. Kevin, that's all we have time for. Today. Okay, all right. Do you want to close? Uh, yeah. I, I, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I'd, be glad, I'd be glad to send you this. We have this thing laminated. It makes a great place map for the kids. <laughs> right? And if there's a drug up there that's one of your favorites and it's not up there, I want you to let me know <laughs> because I want it to be inclusive. So we're about to redo this, right? So if I've left your favorite drug off, please contact me uh, and, uh, and I'd love to hear from you. Otherwise, Sorry that was a little disjointed, but we had some great questions and that was fun. And I will stay up here to answer more questions once once we're done. Sure. We also wanted to remind everybody about uh, the, the meeting next week. Next week is the sponsors. The, right. the, and, and this involves local recovery next week, like the local sponsors. Right. And then the week after that are the, the students in recovery. So next Thursday, all four corporate sponsors, Shoreline, Peer Connection, Lighthouse, and Grand Strand Health are giving 24-minute demonstrations of recovery. They're very varied. So they got 24 minutes on stage to do something creative is what I've asked them to do. So come, and there'll be food. So come back next week, <laughs> Thursday. And then Thursday after that are the students and one special faculty member in recovery who are gonna tell their story on stage. And that special faculty member is a sponsee of mine. <laughs> Hey, and uh, Dr. Uh, we want to uh, obviously applaud the second to thank Dr. McCauley for his talk. But just remember when you come to ask him questions, you're cutting into his sugar frenzy that's about to end. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, where is the